Thank you. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Intravascular Robotics, Reshaping Vascular Intervention. Today's event is being presented by Hanson Medical, the global leader in intravascular robotics. Here is our agenda for today. We have two presenters. Dr. Bismuth will provide an introduction to intravascular robotics, and then Dr. Lumsden will describe the clinical experiences with intravascular robotics at Houston Methodist Hospital. Then we'll have the Q&A period at the end. Our first presenter is Dr. Jean Bismuth. <laughs> Dr. Bismuth is a vascular surgeon and an assistant professor at the Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center at the Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas. Dr. Bismuth and our second speaker, Dr. Lumsden, have been closely involved in the development of intravascular robotics technology from the beginning. Dr. Bismuth has focused his research interests on vascular surgery robotics as well as vascular surgery training and simulation development. He led and published the pivotal 20-patient first-in-man trial of the Magellan Robotic System that led to FDA 510K clearance in 2012, and he's currently a principal investigator on the Rover Registry, which is a post-market, multi-center study of the first 500 cases being performed globally with the Magellan Robotic System. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Bismuth, and I'll now turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Brian, and uh, thanks uh, for tuning in and uh, listening to this webinar, which is hopefully going to be informative for those of you who are interested in uh, intravascular robotics. Uh, as Brian mentioned, we've been involved in this uh, for some years now, about five to six years, and so I think we've, we've determined what the need for uh, robotics uh, is uh, along the way. Um, one of the things we see in a lot of our cases is that they can be long, complex, and somewhat unpredictable. And we think that potentially the robotics have a, a way of making this a more predictable procedure. Um, there are some discrepancies in training and skill sets. We see that when we train our, our residents and fellows. And so this could potentially uh, bridge that gap. Physicians are, as we know, suffering radiation, orthopedic injuries. Um, and I'll go into the radiation bit just, uh, just a little bit. Uh, and then uh, complex cases, uh, as you know, can be uh, uh, difficult, sometimes leading to complications that potentially could be avoided. If you look at uh, radiation injuries, as you know, they're cumulative and they're permanent. And so when we ta start talking about more complex procedures, uh, well, potentially if you can remove the whole component of driving uh, to the uh, site of interest, uh, you could potentially also reduce the amount of radiation you're exposed to. Uh, and this is just a, an, an image from uh, a uh, publication in 2009 uh, looking at skin injury and then again looking at the risk of fatal cancer, uh, predicted fatal risk of cancer. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the robotic system itself, we're talking about the Magellan robotic system, there are two main components to the driving. Uh, one is the remote catheter manipulator, uh, which uh, has essentially two uh, attachments for the, uh, the two catheters, which I'll go in and explain a little bit uh, more carefully in, in a second. And then it has the remote wire manipulator, which is on the back end, essentially consisting of uh, two belts, which can drive the uh, robot, pull it back, and also torque it. Uh, this is the physician workstation. Uh, now, this is not the only component uh, from which you can drive. There's also a pendant, which is at bedside, which allows you to do everything uh, you see here except for uh, the 3D controller. Um, so primarily, uh, I personally navigate uh, with uh, the buttons, but we do use the 3D controller as well. The foot pedal allows you to shift between um, the leader, which is the uh, equivalent of your diagnostic catheter, uh, and the sheath, uh, which would be the equivalent of a sheath you would use for any case. This is a, a video just uh, going through the details of the, uh, of the uh, mechanism. Uh, you saw there the workstation. Here's the RCM uh, and the catheter being loaded onto it. You can then see from the workstation how you can control the guide wire, driving it and retracting it. Um, also, here you can see how you can torque it. The two belts basically uh, run over each other and can torque that wire very much like you would do with your own fingers or a torque device. Uh, again, the same mechanism you can use with either of the buttons uh, for the leader, uh, advancing that, and of course flexing it. Um, and you can also, uh, as you can see here, rotate it in a second um, right here. And uh, that allows you, gives you actually six degrees of freedom, uh, which can be very important uh, when you're working in this uh, somewhat uh, complex three-dimensional three space. Um, here you can see the six French uh, catheter, which I'll describe in a second. 
Uh, that allows uh, actually the single catheter that has uh, two bends, a proximal bend and a distal bend, uh, and uh, essentially this you can you can allows you to see how the catheter can function in that three-dimensional space. Um, if you look at this chart from uh, Cook catheters, essentially you can create almost every uh, uh, catheter here with one single device, uh, which allows you to cannulate many different targets uh, with the same system, uh, a clear advantage as far as I see it. If you look at the two catheters that are available in the uh, Magellan family of robotic catheters, uh, the first one we started using was the um, uh, robotic catheter 9 French, which has essentially uh, two telescoping uh, systems, a robotic inner leader catheter and a, ro a robotic outer guide sheath or catheter. Uh, and uh, they uh, can accommodate wires 014, 018, 035. This has primarily been used uh, as far as, as our uh, caseload for uh, AAA or FIVARs and carotid stenting, iliac SFA disease. The Magellan 6 French system is probably gaining more um, uh, momentum as far as embolization and low extremity below knee procedures and has those two uh, bends as I mentioned in the previous video. Uh, if you take a, a little more detailed look at the uh, 9 French system, uh, it has uh, full roll cap capability, um, it has a 6 French uh, outer diameter for the uh, inner leader catheter and, uh, and then accordingly has a 9 French outer diameter for the uh, sheath. Uh, the leader can bend up to 180 degrees, uh, 360 rotation and the sheath can bend 90 degrees with 360 rotation. Uh, the 6 French system again can rotate 360 degrees, has uh, less bend at the distal uh, bend which is 140 and uh, the uh, proximal bend 60. Uh, this is a case we did live um, but this is really just to show you the, the SFA intervention. Uh, so normally as you know the wire if you were to uh, advance it uh, without support it would like to go into that terminal branch, that collateral. You can drive this with enough support through the uh, occlusion but you can also, as we did in this case, which I'm not going to show the video, but you can go subintimally. And the, the nice thing about this is you can angle the, the catheter, the leader catheter, towards uh, the location you want to go towards and, again, re-enter by bending it the opposite way. Um, this is kind of uh, a, a depiction of the uh, literature that we've um, amassed around the uh, catheter. So there's some preclinical pre work, which I'll show briefly. Um, that was really just safety data on animal work. Uh, our first in men uh, presentation, which was uh, 20 cases Brian had mentioned in his introduction. Um, some uh, carotid stenting uh, potential benefits, uh, FIVAR case reports, and we're going on to what we hope is going to be a good clinical uh, caseload of the ro rover registry. Uh, the Magellan in vivo uh, animal study basically uh, suggests that reduced vessel wall damage using uh, the intravascular uh, robotics was pretty significant and also we may have improved uh, catheter flexibility and range of motion which we, is not surprising. Uh, if you look here this depiction uh, really shows very clearly how on your um, uh, right hand side or rather your left hand side would be the manual catheterization. You see a significant amount of injuries and there are, are major injuries which you see none of uh, with the robotic catheterization. So at the very least uh, it's uh, no worse than manual catheterization. If you look at the initial world, worldwide experience which is now approaching 500 cases, uh, this is, uh, includes both uh, cases done by interventionalist cardio interventional ca cardiologists, radiologists, as well as a uh, large amount of vascular surgeons. Uh, most of the cases are aortofemoral, um, there are some EVARs, uh, FIVARs, um, but essentially uh, we pretty much cover the gamut of uh, treatments. I think the one thing that's a little bit different is our experience. We've done a, a number of venous cases uh, treating uh, subclavian, brachiocephalic, SVC, and iliac uh, occlusions. Uh, but of course, as far as the arterial uh, beds, we, we cover pretty much the entire uh, vascular beds. Um, we have found that there are, there are some benefits to using uh, 3D imaging and Dr. Lumsden is going to go through some cases and show you this in more detail. But essentially we, we do a lot of uh, fusion, image, fusion imaging uh, using cone beam CT. This allows us to use some markers uh, that gives us uh, reliable targets. But the stability of the robotic platform is really what takes it to the next step and, and allows us to treat uh, with relative ease. This is uh, essentially a depiction of 
the number of aortograms or angiograms we do in order to uh, define a vessel before getting into it. When we combine the robotics and the 3D imaging, uh, we are able to substantially reduce the number of angiograms we use. Essentially, in a lot of cases, 80% of those with 0 to 1 angiogram or aortograms per case. And so we go straight for uh, the can, uh, cannulation of the, of the vessel in question. You can see that depicted here where we're trying for an, S uh, sorry, an SMA, uh, which had been failed on by one of my partners. He tried again in this case, again using the markers, so it's not just the markers. Um, here we are with the robotics. Uh, you can see the guide wire advancing, our leader and our sheath are at the top. And I think really the stability of the platform here, we're just advancing, advancing the leader, which goes in with relative ease into the SMA. That first ring sh uh, uh, shows the origin of the vessel, again here entering, and then we're going to advance the wire. But just to show how we combine those two platforms. Uh, as far as the learning curve, this is actually a slide from one of our partners here, Miguel Valderabano, who is an uh, uh, electrophysiologist using the different robotic system, the Sensei system, which also belongs to Hanson Medical. But his learning curve and that of uh, a lot of the uh, users for the Sensei system was around uh, 20 to 30. And uh, so, you know, they did need a little bit of time, got frustrated, but then eventually learned it and have been able to reduce their radiation times to about five minutes. Um, we saw that in our first in man, uh, that uh, operator number two down the middle of that column uh, is actually a cardiac surgeon who has never touched a wire or a catheter in his life. And you can see he was able to do all the cases with significant more time, significantly more time, but was able to do them. So I think the learning curve for um, the uh, Magellan system is a lot lower than it is for the uh, Sensei system. Uh, this is the first publication we're looking at from the Rover at Registry. This essentially combining um, uh, retrospective data from uh, Houston Methodist as well as the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute. And essentially what it shows, these are uh, very much end-of-the-road cases, cases we failed on, difficult cases, and our treatment success and target success are quite high at 91 and 92 percent. Um, and you can see sort of the different vascular beds that we, we treated here. So I think that's pretty significant. Um, and I think in conclusion, clinical value um, it really is uh, enabling uh, advanced endovascular procedures with more ease, less time potentially, uh, provide a reliable and effective uh, therapy delivery, and uh, as, as we move on to sitting at the, uh, the uh, control station, uh, reducing the radiation exposure, I think long term is going to be very important. Um, the catheter roadmap, there are some catheters in development uh, that are going to be larger, um, and they'll be able to deliver some of the other therapies, uh, such as fenestrated EVAR, uh, aortic valves, and so on. Uh, and then there is a, a, a transport system, which is uh, pretty attractive uh, as you could buy one system and move it from one uh, interventional suite to another. Um, having said this, I'll uh, then move back over to Brian and we'll let Dr. Lumsden come in and give his presentation.